I know him personally, a, a great lover of rare plants on the rare plant committee, a friend of ours, and a friend of rare plants. He's going to tell us about uh, some endangered species that we all should be paying more attention to. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, how, about a how about a round of applause for the rare plant program? So this is kind of a talk, it's kind of a to-do list, maybe a little bit of a uh, rare plant matchmaking service for people who uh, want to champion some plants here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to try and get through this information here, fast and furious, so follow, follow me if you can. Um, but I just start by saying that uh, this was sort of an offshoot of um, preparing a listing petition for the Livermore tar plant, which uh, uh, I submitted last fall, and uh, also part of uh, an, a, an offshoot of the article that Jim Andre and I wrote for the current Vermonti article, which talks about um, the pace of listing and what it was in the past to what it is now, and um, you know, listing at the uh, state and uh, federal Endangered Species Act level. Um, and it's slowed down, but the pace of adding plants to the rare plant inventory is not. So, um, you know, we're going behind. Um, and anyway, why, why do we care? Why do we care? We just heard about it. Um, but uh, a big reason is that, you know, if we list things under the um, Endangered Species Act, under at the state or the federal level, there's more opportunities for funding, there's better protection, um, there's management plans, recovery plans. Um, so the plants, in the long run, have a better chance of survival. Um, so let's get to it. Just a couple of themes here. Um, vigilance, because uh, you know development just creeps along. And the next thing we know, we could turn around and one plant population could be gone. So it's better to be vigilant, be better prepared, and uh, you know, uh, do our work ahead of time. And uh, the second one there, sound science plus passion equals action. I mean, that's a core at CNPS. That's a core value of CNPS. So, um, you know, I know we have a lot of passionate people here who are good scientists. So we can get a lot of this work done. Um, and the power, the uh, power of herbaria. Uh, a lot of the rare plants in the inventory, we know about them. And we know they're rare because of the collections that were made, and they may not have been visited. Time, but uh, you know we draw on the uh, information that these areas have, which is uh, super valuable to us. Um, and in doing this, uh, preparing uh, this list, you know there's a lot of precarious species out there. So this top ten only represents a subset of other species that are really on the brink of uh, extinction. Um, and then you know, pilgrimages, I'm a big fan. I like to go travel around and see rare plants. And uh, you know, you can't get people to protect something unless they love them, and they're not going to love them unless they know them. So let's get a little intimate with these things here. Uh, sources, of course, you know, there's uh, a lot of sources here that uh, are typical. The CNDDB, the consortium, which is a great resource, and of course the uh, flagship program, the CMPS, our inventory. Um, <clears throat> and then also, you know, a uh, couple other things, Jeff's knee floor, protologs, and all the people who fill out CNDDB forms, you know, it's awesome. Thank you. Um, let's just talk about taxa and uh, number of occurrences here, just briefly. So what, basically the way that I, um, built this list was looking at one bees and twos that either have one occurrence, so one population, or uh, two occurrences or two populations. Um, in total, there's 197 species that fit this criteria. So these are inherently rare things that um, just, you know, there's not many of them out there, so we should definitely be on the lookout to uh, make sure that um, if they need help, we're going to give it. Um, then the criteria here, Pretty much stuck to uh, plants only recognized, currently recognized in the Jepson Manual. Um, things that were endemics, of course, plants that did not have uh, endangered st species status at the state or federal level. Um, the rare plant rank of 1B or 2B. Then the number of occurrences, as I mentioned, one or two. Um, and then, you know, serious threats, meaning that somebody has taken the time to fill out the threat information. 
um, in the CNDDB or the rare plant inventory to, to know, um, you know, are these things seriously threatened or is there any information about threats? And there was some, uh, uh, a serious problem with uh, a lack of threat information as we heard from uh, Nick on and, and uh, Shannon on Thursday. Then location precision is important. If we don't know exactly where these things are, it's hard to make a case to get them listed. Um, and then slam dunks. We want these things to be, um, you know, very good cases where they make a lot of sense, and we're not going to get a lot of pushback uh, from the agency saying, "Well, maybe we shouldn't list this one because of, you know, this or that reason." So we want some really good, solid cases. Um, then the issues here: we got um, age of collections. You know, that's a problem. Um, old CNDDB observation information, which is also a problem. Um, and lack of demographic information. A lot of CNDDB occurrences, you know, there aren't really, it's just presence or absence. They're there, we saw them, but we don't know how many there were. Um, then, as I mentioned, lack of threats. Um, herbarium specimens that need annotation, you know, we can't uh, compile all the information and all the location information about um, uh, rare plant occurrences and locations unless um, these annotations are updated and those, an those updates are in the consortium good annotated specimens also make it easier to uh, collect and, and uh, analyze the information. But um, I will say that you know, if somebody else did this exercise using the same criteria, there is going to be a little bit of subjectivity. Um, you can't take um, all the subjectivity out of trying to select a top 10 because it's pretty much impossible. So, um, you know, results could be different varied on uh, the analyzer. But uh, just to show some of this issue-related data here, um, in terms of herbarium specimens, uh, you can see that um, you know, for pre the last millennia, pre-2000, um, there's a lot of collections that are just, that's where they were um, dated from. So not a whole lot of collecting going on. I think we know that already. But the numbers down there at the bottom are this. You know, they're just old and old I used uh, prior to 2000. You know, if there wasn't uh, uh, any information, <coughs> uh, no data, then 65% uh, for 1Bs and 58, 67, so forth. Um, and then, so also for CNDDB observation information, you know, around 50% of them are what I would consider old or you know, pre 2000. So we're going to have a lot of people going out. Um, that's why the rare plant control <coughs> program is so important. Um, trying to get some of these species focused on um, would be a good thing. And then the lack of threat information. So we've got, um, for one bees with one occurrence, 58% of them didn't have threat information. That makes it very difficult to try and um, make a case for why they should be listed. So, um, you know, rare plant treasure hunt people, any one individual should go out and, uh, you know, visit these populations and make some assessments on what the threats are. So uh, this is sort of the dating part of the talk, where um, if you guys fancy a rare plant and want to champion it as a petitioner, um, you know, we should talk. And, uh, you know, for you uh, agency people in the room, this is your to-do list. <laughs> Here's just the distribution statewide, pretty much kind of clustered over to the west where all the development is, but um, we have stuff that goes all the way up to, um, you know, Siskiyou <coughs> County and then everything all the way down to Orange County. So um, it's widely distributed and lots of people can get involved statewide. Um, the first one here, um, Yukaipa Onion, Allium Marvini, which is in Riverside, San Bernardino counties. This, um, this occurrence right here is historic, so we don't really know around or where its exact position is, but here's, um, here's a good occurrence right there. And um, let's see. It's in Chimis Chaparral on clay, and it's about 3,000 feet. It was described in 1921, but it was added to the inventory in 2001, and that's uh, partially because it was formally recognized as uh, Allium Matakaiten. Um, but it was last seen in 1993, according to the CNDDB, and no number of individuals were known, but it's um, said to be threatened by native, uh, non native plants and urbanization. There's some photos. Um, 
Clark, you can send a ratio, just one population here. It's known from the coast of Marin County. Um, here's Tomales right there, and um, Tomales Bay, Point Reyes. Um, it's on coastal bluffs, it's about 50 feet in elevation. It was described in 1990 and added to the inventory in 98. Um, the last time it was seen, there was about 1,000 individuals, and that was in 1998. Um, threatened by road, uh, grazing and road maintenance and weeds. Um, and, uh, you know, all of these, most of them, uh, are good candidates for state listing. So that's a nice one. Then we got an areogonum down uh, the Big Bear area. You know, Big Bear um, on the south side of the lake has been heavily developed, and um, so a lot of plants have gone extinct or are living in an area undescribed. This one is one that um, I actually got a chance to visit a couple years ago, and it is um, in a really bad place. Um, around some boat docks and a restaurant, um, rather than the shop shore, but it's uh, in Juniper and Am Lake, your community, at, at about 6,700 feet. It was described in uh, 2004, it was added to the inventory in 2005, and uh, the lot that it's on is um, co commercial, it's owned commercial, so go buy it maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we go to Scott Valley, um, west of uh, Wairika. There's uh, the locations there on the west side of Scott Valley. It's a Scott Valley buckwheat. Um, in yellow pine forest and scrub and in alluvium, about 3,000 feet. Described in 2004 and only added to the inventory in 2007. Um, and when it was last seen in 2003, there was 100 plants. Um, it's threatened by housing development um, and horticulture collecting, which I thought was an interesting threat. Helianthus inexpectatus, maybe some of you have heard of this one. It was only described a couple years ago, 2010, uh, associated with the Newhall Ranch development. Grows in freshwater seeps um, with willows at about 1,000 feet, and its threats are um, from hydrologic changes and the adjacent development, possibly urban runoff. But only 20 plants were seen the last time that um, it, was, uh, it was observed. Um, this one also was recently in the news, uh, only described in 2013. You might have seen some talks on it in North Calbot a couple years ago. But it actually grows in cultivated fields at about 40 feet in elevation. And uh, one of the threats here was untimely plowing, which was interesting. Um, so the fields are plowed at the appropriate time every year, and then after they are uh, sort of uh, you know, fallow, then the plant comes up, sets seed, and, and uh, goes dormant again for the year. Puxinellia parashite, this is actually a state listed rare plant in New Mexico also, but it's in San Bernardino County in Rabbit Springs. It uh, grows in alkali seeps at about 3,000 feet. Described in 1928, and it was added to the inventory pretty early in 74, but it's threatened by uh, groundwater pumping, grazing, flood control, and uh, uh, it grows right on the roadside, so it's also uh, uh, threatened because of its proximity to the road. Um, then we got this nice little Napa checker bloom up in Napa County, up near uh, both A State Park and near Mount George. Grows on rhyolite and chaparral about 1,300 feet. It was um, described in 2008, so also a new one, and uh, added to the inventory in 2009. Um, but it's threatened by vineyard development. Maybe 30 individuals were seen last time it was uh, observed. And this is sort of a, a holy grail here. I know uh, I've been out to try and find it. Uh, no others have. And there's some thought that maybe it's actually extinct um, now. But in part in California, I'm down in um, the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, it is uh, uh, by Kettleman City. And there's thought that it's also on the current wildlife refuge down here. But um, last seen, as according to the CNDB, was 1999. No number of plants recorded. Um, and I know that the field it grows on is dist and has been uh, planted with wheat for dryland farming. So it's also um, in a um, precarious position and there's no photos for it either. So that'll have to do. Uh, the last one here is uh, Verbena down in Orange, uh, Verbicina down in Orange County, um, down here by Laguna Beach. It's, you know, likes to be by the beach, that's cool. Um, it's a maritime chaparral, 600 feet. 
it was described in 1885, but added to the inventory in 1984. And, um, last seen in 2001, where the uh, 40, 4,500 plants were recorded. But it's uh, threatened by housing development. It's I think a little bit of it is on a state park, but um, there's still some um, populations that are out on uh, um, developable land. So also could do some help. <coughs> But next steps here, you know, targeted rare plant treasure hunts for these things. You know, as I mentioned, there's 197 plants that have one or two occurrences that um, should also be a focus of uh, the rare plant treasure hunt effort. Getting some good demographic population data is going to be really important for these things, for making a case for them to be listed. Um, and then finding listing authors or petitioners. So raise your hands. Who's, uh, who's interested? All right, there we go. Um, but yeah, we need, to, we need to get some people on this. And uh, you know, then once those are done, elevate the next round of tax uh, um, to start the process over again. So just some acknowledgments, um, maybe some time for questions. You had a number of uh, the top ten up there that were varieties and subspecies, mm -hmm. and uh, you're probably aware, but um, the federal listing uh, criteria, they actually, I kind of saw like a, a somewhat of an internal diagram where they actually prioritize uh, full species versus variety or subspecies, and I wonder if you have thoughts on whether we should be doing the same for prioritizations or... What yeah, I, that was something I thought about, but because most of these candidates, or actually all these candidates, are uh, state listing. Um, it wasn't as much of a concern, but yeah, when we're talking about federally listed species, that's something that definitely take into consideration. Naomi? Um, uh, great talk, Keith. Um, I was thinking that one other criteria, and I don't remember if it was one that was in there that might need to be added for more bulletproofness, is um, taxonomic status, or if there's uncertainty. Because uh, Allium arvinii still has taxonomic uh, and if you look on the consortium, there's a bunch of new specimens been annotated as Allium arvinii expanding its range. So that's, I think, another good um, Just rephrase the question a little bit. Yeah. Um, did everybody hear that? No. No, um, she was just saying taxonomic ambiguity for some of these things may make it difficult to provide a good case for them for listing because in the case of Allium marvini, um, it's somewhat taxonomically dubious because it was formally recognized as Allium maticitin. So making sure that uh, uh, you know candidates are um, taxonomically sound. Thank you. Thank you.